There's no feeling more intense than starting over. If you've broken your scratch project moments after you've shared it, as I have, or you spent hours working on a project only to notice too late that one of your sprites has unexplainably gone missing. If you've made use of that difficult to name thing of thing block, within the sensing category, amazingly useful but capable due to a scratch bug of leaving you crying as it dumps all your scripts in one big and ordered heap. If you've made real progress coding a game over the course of the week, only to come back the next day to discover you weren't even logged in. Nothing has been saving. Starting over is harder than starting up. If you're not ready for that, like if you've already had a bad day at school, then what you're about to go through may be too much. Feel free to go away and come back. I'll be here. All right. Thanks for coming with me on this trip. I'll understand if you need to take a break at any point. Just find a safe place to stop and remember to pause the game by pressing P. On Scratch you can find loads of remixed or reimagined recreations of existing games. And with good reason. George Bernard Shaw said, Imitation is not just the sincerest form of flattery, it's the sincerest form of learning. This game is a recreation of a game that came out in 2017 titled Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy. That game in turn was a homage to a free game that came out in 2002. Both games involved dragging yourself, using a hammer, up a mountain assembled from assets and objects sourced from many other games. It seems appropriate then that, when trying to recreate Getting Over It in Scratch, that we should construct our mountain from the same assets used in literally millions of Scratch projects, the unmistakable contents of the Scratch costume library. Unlike Unity or Unreal, Scratch does not provide you with a built-in physics or 3D rendering engine. It is no state-of-the-art debugger, you can't even pause your scripts. We are forced to program old school. Our experience capped at 30 frames per second on a 480 by 360 pixel stage. But these very restrictions force us to experiment, to think out of the box, to grow as developers as we become masters of all things Scratch. And let's not forget, what we lack in technology we make up for in community. This fantastic bunch of budding software engineers, building, learning, creating, playing, remixing. As diverse a group of people as the very Scratch assets we now so skillfully attempt to ascend. The act of climbing, in the digital world or in the real world, has certain essential properties that give the game its flavour. No amount of forward progress is guaranteed. When you start getting over it, you're standing next to a dead tree, which blocks the way to the entire rest of the game. You prod and poke at it, exploring the limits of your reach and strength, trying to find a way up. When starting a new Scratch project, that initial blank slate is both refreshing and at times a little scary. Wouldn't it be great if we could travel forward in time and review our finished projects to see how well they turned out? I certainly wish we could. The real draw of coding, what gives it that special zing, is the challenge of accomplishing something you've never done before. At this point, you don't want to fall into the trap of rushing into creating loads of content, designing all the levels, the player costumes, all the easier stuff that can be perfected later. No, before all that, you need to prod and poke that tree. That is, understanding the coding difficulties you're expecting to face and try out any ideas to solve them. You may not be able to time travel, but at least this way you can get a good idea of how well your project is likely to go and potentially save yourself a lot of time. This project began life a couple of months ago as three simple scripts, the player, hammer and level. I spent no time on the art, just using Scratchcat and a few rectangles drawn in the sprite editor. The scripts for the player quickly mocked up in a similar fashion to those I teach on my YouTube channel. With the hammer I had to improvise because I'd never done anything quite like that before. And boy did I prod and poke at those scripts. What I had imagined and the results I was achieving were hard to reconcile. The hammer and the player sprites would get stuck in the walls and ground, shake and jiggle and clip up to the top of the screen. Worst of all, when I tried the bread and butter action of lifting the player up upon the hammer, any what? tiny movement would throw the player into a crazy up and down motion as if bouncing upon a possessed pogo stick. 
things don't always turn out as you want them to. And sometimes it's good to take a break. So for the time being, I shelved the project, letting it slowly slip down the list of unshared projects, joining the countless multitude of unfinished, unseen projects that haunt the vast storage archives of MIT. Have you, as you've been playing this game, stopped to wonder how you can balance on a hammer that is held out to one side? It feels quite natural in game, but try it in the real world and you'll not get your feet off the ground. No, this game is bending the rules of physics. Although I was not actively working on the project, the desire to code the game and solve the initial problems constantly played on my mind. Finally, I decided to give it another go. Research is a powerful tool. Don't just rely on what you think you know. YouTube can be a great resource for gameplay videos. Being able to pause and rewind the action is invaluable. Did you know that you can step through videos frame by frame using the angled bracket keys? My research helped confirm many thoughts I'd been having and also uncovered some nuances around mouse movement that had really got me stumped. All this was food for my brain and I was super fired up to bring it all to scratch. And so, back in Scratch, I completely restructured the player and hammer scripts, bringing the scripts together in a single sprite. This allowed the movement of the two objects to be tracked together and to move dependent on each other. Of course, in coding, as in real life, you often have to compromise. It isn't reasonable to implement a full physics engine in Scratch, but often it's enough to create a good estimate of what the player is expecting. One plus one is two. If this wasn't always the case, if sometimes the answer was three, then we would be in trouble. The addition operator is therefore referred to as deterministic. Similarly in Scratch, if your player sprite reports that it isn't touching the level, then you would expect, assuming the player is not moved relative to the level, that this would continue to be the case. As it turns out, the sensing block in Scratch does not behave like this. It can be non-deterministic, this is down to how Scratch draws its sprites. Their size and shape can change very slightly depending where on the screen they are first visualised. This can easily break a carefully crafted platforming script, resulting in sprites becoming trapped, teleporting to the edge of the screen, or worse of all, your game freezing up. One solution I'm fond of using is to create a short fix-up script that, on detecting an unexpected collision, moves the sprite this way and that in an ordered pattern until it finds a spot close by where the sprite no longer...